Welcome to a new series of Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Paddle Edition. Today we sit down with Paul Atkinson, one of the leaders in the paddle community in South Africa. Paul was also one of the founders of the Vodacom Caddy Foundation in the mid-1990s, which set out to develop and empower caddies through South Africa and thus improve not only the experience for the golfers, but also for the clubs. Paul's been at the forefront of many sports, including golf, squash, and now paddle. And as paddle is such a fast growing sport, blazing across our country and different regions of the world, we felt it was only appropriate to sit down and have a chat with him as he fills us in on the development of different courts, what it takes to build a series of paddle courts and the different markets that he's opening up paddle courts within South Africa through his business, Paddle365. So guys, something we're very proud of, welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Paddle Edition. Sorry, Pedal. I don't want to get into trouble here. Hey guys, today's episode is brought to you proudly by Emmet Beats. Music by athletes for athletes. It's music that you can use in your live streams, on your social media posts, without fear of any copyright infringement. And now we're proud to announce the launch of the walkout edition of our fourth album, Big Dog. This is music that you can have played at any event streamed by Emmet Media. Any competition that you come to that Emmet Media is streaming, you can ask to have the song on this album played as your walkout music. It's a series of 90 second tracks that you can train to and practice to and set your mind to knowing that when the beat drops exactly that's when you're going to bring what you need to bring to the platform. So we'll just record, we'll chat, we're going to chat about you. I mean, do you want to chat a little bit about your background as well? Uh, or do you want to focus on the paddle stuff? No, you tell me. Okay. I don't mind, you know, okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's very annoying though that you, you look exactly the same age. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was our interview with Paul Atkinson. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah. yeah, thanks for joining us. All right, so cool. Paul, welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions. Uh, that's what I'm calling the, the podcasts. And within each of our, sorry, this is one of my, uh, uh, my clients here, uh, who's also happens to be my GP sending me his pictures of what he's eating. Shall we see what, uh, have a look. Okay, Paul, that, that was breakfast. Can you see the oats? Really terrible oats. Then, I don't know, a poo and eggs, a scrambled eggs and mince. And now he's sending me a dish of berries that it looks like he's peeing into. So I don't know. All right, cool. There we go. Woolies blueberries. I've never known anyone to eat out as much as he does. So hang on. Sorry, that should be on silent. Give me one second. Sorry, I'm still so hungry. Maybe we can tell him he could be pregnant, huh? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's start that again. All right. So, Paul, Coffee and Conversations with Champions is what we're calling the podcast series. So I've got the gym. I've got the media company. Uh, we've also got my personal show where we chat. So... Like the personal show is based more on self-development and business. The gym is the lifestyle, fitness, health stuff. And the Emmet Media is where I've been streaming um, the sports podcast through. So I think we'll go through this. And what makes me very, very proud is to have you here and also the first conversation about paddle because I think that's something um, that is taking the world by storm pretty much. Mm. So... Uh, Paul Atkinson, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, we met when you had started the Vodacom Caddy Foundation. Sorry, can I say Vodacom Caddy? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. How I think about it. Yeah. Don't don't they still owe you some sponsorship stuff now? The Vodacom. <laughs> the, hey. Ooh, the Vodacom Pedal Coaching Foundation. I like the sound of that. Hey? Yeah. Yeah. Just we've known each other a long time. I'm um, mm. sure we started the Caddy Foundation in 1997, sure. um, and obviously, like you said, we're sponsored by Vodacom for a good eight years. And it was very something very, very that I'm very proud of. Very cool to be involved in a sports business, but also in a business where everybody in the circle gains some kind of benefit from the mm -hmm. caddy themselves, obviously, um, to the golfer, to the golf club, to Vodacom, and to ourselves. So it was, I think, it's quite funny at the young age of 23, it's, it sort of set me on the trajectory sure. of my whole life of wanting to be involved in businesses that everybody managed to get something out of. It wasn't lopsided. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I was in the golf industry for a long time, always been very involved in the squash community um, and, and in clubs in general. Um, when the Caddy Foundation sort of ran its course, it was then, um, I then moved into renewable energy space and I've got a, a renewable energy company that I've had for the last eight years. Um, and that's done obviously pretty well in South Africa given the circumstances. And now, you know, with, with Pedal, um, I saw this coming two, three years ago. I actually started mm. pitching to some of the clubs that I was associated with. And for the exact same reason as, as the golf, it's a really good opportunity for a community-based, healthy, fun, all-involved kind of business um, mm. that has a very much a social aspect to it, but at the same time, a, a business opportunity for the clubs in particular and for, for people like ourselves. 100%. I think just to give people an idea, because they might not be aware of the Caddy Foundation and the work that you did. I mean, at, at your peak, how many caddies were you working with and how many clubs? Oh, sure. We had um, over 4,500 caddies um, across the clubs around mm -hmm. South Africa. Um, so it was substantial. Um, a lot of staff. There were, weren't staff per se, but yeah. a lot of people have done management. Um, and from there, we then actually moved into golf course media, golf carts, mm. post shops. So it was a substantially sized business in the golf industry. Mm. It was Vodacom's biggest single sponsorship at the time. When we approached Vodacom, I didn't even know who Vodacom was. That's how young it was. Um, yeah. And I, I was sort of typically going to go to the Coca-Colas and the Liberty Lifes of the world. Um, because that's who we thought would sponsor something like this. And somebody said to me, oh, you should change, change, try this company called Vodak. Um, and I was like, who is that? Um, <laughs> obviously, uh, Vodacom went on to be who Vodacom is. And yeah. so we were a bit lucky with that. But yeah, what an incredible experience, you know, employed a, a full-time management mm. crew of over 120 guys, young guys, yeah. um, uh, um, caddies, trainers, guys that used to work for Ernie Els or mm. Tiger uh, or Nick Price came and worked with the company. And we really, I think... Um, took caddy to a different level mm -hmm. and even to this day even though the caddy foundation doesn't exist per se every club sort of has a caddy foundation now mm -hmm. and it's fantastic i think um, they're still struggling as a group but they're definitely getting way more recognition and acknowledgement and benefits than they used to get before and if that's what we had created and that was the the the, the vehicle um, then fantastic then mm -hmm. i can I can look back in when I'm 70 and say, you know, we, we did something good for caddies in South Africa. Yeah, 100%. And I just wanted to actually touch on that for a bit before we move into the paddle. I mean, you really positively, I mean, I was there pretty much from the beginning, kind of, and I just saw the positive effect that you had on these guys. I mean, you're talking 4,000 lives, excluding your managers, where you raised the bar, you raised the level for the caddies, um, you raise their self-respect, their self-worth. I mean, you're putting the guys into uniforms. It became something to be really proud of. I know the members absolutely loved it. And you did it. I think the, the sponsorship from Vodacom was because you didn't want the clubs to incur that cost, you know, that management and development cost. Because in essence, it really was a caddy development program, right? You know, to help the guys. I think the first of it is still in any sport in South Africa, to be mm. quite honest. Like, really, yeah. um, yes, there's other very successful development uh, initiatives that have taken place. and we're, But back then, it sort of was unheard of. Mm. Um, we were told by many people it would never, ever work. It's just not possible. 
Um, and I think maybe because we were so young, we just thought we got what do we got to lose? And yeah, you know, guys got funeral policies, yep. um, training, education, employment, real employment opportunities mm. were always employed from within. And I think the big thing for me, Nick, was that you were dealing with four, four and a half thousand caddies, but then the immediate um, family and yep. responsibilities around them, we positively affected 12, 13, 14,000 people. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I think even, though. yeah, I think even more than that, because the, the numbers are for every employed person in South Africa, they, they are affecting eight people. Right. So yeah, there respond, we so, I mean, you can run, multiply that by eight and you get an idea of the lives, the yeah. lives that were affected. Um, mm. we just, it didn't, didn't help my golf though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, but, in the yeah. beginning it helped all of our golf, and then not so much. Yeah, like correct. Me. Yeah, because it became more admin that you like you you less and yeah. less on the course and more and more in the office. And I think also exactly. something to talk about is, you know, 1997 South Africa was a democracy just short of two years. So this development stuff had never really been done before. You guys were bridging a lot of new ground, um, and as you said, you know, the vision and the thought to, to do that. Was was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, tell us about the paddle, um, because I mean, it, it's yeah, everywhere you look. There's a paddle court, yeah. and uh, let, let's chat. It. What if it, man, What is paddle, and how do you pronounce yeah, so, it? Uh, is it paddle or pedal? I think the funny thing. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually pedal, but pedal. Uh, it depends on where you are in the world. I think South Africa sort of a the paddle mm. word. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy, man. I think. I think it's a number of things. Like a lot of people are saying, why? Like why? This is a sport that's been around since 1969. This hey. is not a new sport. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's been around a long time. Ooh. Actually started in um, Argentina. And the way it came about was a, a man um, didn't have enough space for a tennis court. He wanted, to, he wanted to, a tennis court. So he effectively created this hybrid version and put mm. some fence and glass around it. And, and Paddle was born. And sure. then it sort of left Argentina and went to Spain, and Spain took it up first. And mm -hmm. it became a big sport. I think it's the second or third biggest sport in the country behind soccer. Um, and it's been there for a long time. And there's a, there's a, um, there was tours and professional circuits. Mm -hmm. and, and, then it's, and then it sort of migrated a little bit into Europe. And then it's one of those crazy COVID stories where, for whatever reason, during COVID, post COVID, it's literally been the sport that has gone absolutely crazy. Mm. Uh, places like Sweden and Switzerland, you're talking a thousand courts in a tiny little country. Spain is, uh, I don't even know the number, I think it's mm -hmm. two or 3,000 courts. Argentina, the same. Um, started, and then it's now starting to move across to America. America's big on pickleball, which is another mm. form of racket sport, but paddle is now moving across there. Mm. And then again, also in COVID, one particular company called Africa Paddle brought a court into the country. Um, there was one out in Johannesburg at one stage and then elderly, but they were the first commercial mm -hmm. uh, club. And again, for whatever reason, at that time, we now know why, but just went crazy. Um, and I think the key to it is if you look at it, and I sort of go mm -hmm. back to the 80s in South Africa, Mm. Um, in the 80s, squash and tennis was enormous. Everybody yeah. played squash. It was one of the biggest sports in the world in South Africa. And that generation, so you're 45, 50 year old, 55, 60 year old, that's the sport that they played. Mm -hmm. Then it became all about golf. And golf was the big thing, the big mm. networking thing. Everybody started playing golf. Then it became mountain biking. That was yeah. the thing to do. And now I think it's back to racket sports. Right. For a number of reasons. A, it's easy to play, like really basic. Mm. It's not hard on the body, so it doesn't hurt you like squash or you don't need as much skill as tennis. And I think the biggest fundamental is that mom, dad, little Johnny, mm. little Sarah, black, white, pink, it doesn't actually make a difference. Everybody can play this sport. It's the first sport, if you think about it, where... Dad used to go play golf and he was away for five hours or mountain biking for five hours. This is the first mm. sport, like at the Wanderers, where you've got the whole family playing together on, uh, in a sport and everybody can play. That's right. golf. 
I think that's absolutely mm -hmm. critical. And I think given what happened in COVID and everybody wanting that social uh, cohesion and coming together mm -hmm. and being a family unit or a friendship unit or a company unit, I think paddles, that's the big success to it. I think the, the, the social aspect, as you said, is huge. And for us growing up, uh, well, I mean, I'm substantially older than you. You're still uh, 24, right? Judging by the I wish, I wish. <laughs> You know, the growing up on a tennis court, you, you would always have the friend who had the tennis court or you'd have the tennis yeah. court. And yeah. you, there were the squash clubs that you'd belong. I mean, it was either squash or tennis. I mean, that was literally mm -hmm. it. And if you didn't have, you know, tennis courts today are vo very expensive. Those big houses have all been chopped down and turned into clusters. So I think the, the cost of setting up the paddle court is much simpler and also think the 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 game is defined by the time if i understand it correctly you book an hour so it's not a three or four or five you don't know how it's not five sets on a saturday afternoon it's very very social and what i've seen with a lot of the clubs is they built around a social right there's restaurants there's coffee shops there's yeah, places for you to get ice for your ankle, these kind of things. <laughs> I, I saw I that, that in Cape Town when I was you there. You know, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually, it's everything about the social vibe, yeah. you know. Um, it, it's it's almost like a coffee shop mm. with paddle or yeah. a kid's yeah. area with paddle, mm. not paddle with, a, and it's so funny because if you really think back, and, and I actually had a conversation at a squash committee meeting last night, and I was saying, mm. guys, it's ridiculous. All Paddle has done is gone and put some music in the background, a nice vibe. Mm. What has stopped every squash center in South Africa putting music in there? So when you walk in, you, you don't feel like you isolated and by yourself. Make it a bit more vibey. Mm. Make better lighting, etc. So what they've done or what Paddle has done is not rocket science. Yeah. It's literally just providing. The difference is when you're going to build a four-court club, for argument's sake, mm. To put it in perspective, a court costs about 600,000 Rand. Your yeah. civils underneath the court cost about 200,000 Rand. So your court's about 800,000 Rand. Mm. But to put the coffee shop in and a little clubhouse and music and uh, a little pro shop, you're basically looking at about when we put it all together for a four court build, you, you're looking close to a five or six million Rand investment. Mm -hmm. Now it's not substantial money, but it's still it's still five or six million rand. Mm. When last was five or six million rand put into tennis or into squash or so here you have this really beautiful yeah. facility mm. with a great coffee shop with a great little pro shop plus this buzz that's going around. And for us, it's about the the sites that we are going to. We want it to become the community destination again. Mm -hmm. That's where your park run will go from or mm -hmm. your bicycling club. It's your hub in the community where everybody gets together and say, right, we're going to meet at the paddle club. Whether they're going to play paddle or not, it's inevitable that they will, but that's sort mm. of the environment that you're trying to create. And because you're spending substantial money on a club, people are happy to pay mm. 100 rand an hour or 150 rand an hour and a half because they see the value. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, so the, a couple of points on that. Where does a family get to spend an hour together for 400 rand? or an hour and a half together for 600 rand you know that's a big point for those looking to invest in the business what 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 i think makes it so de a definitive you know okay yes or no is the fact that the game is set to an hour or an hour and a half so you know mm -hmm. what your return on investment is going to be i think if you booked out a mm -hmm. tennis court or a tennis club it would be morning and afternoon potentially you know, if you could, mm. because you don't know how long the games are going to go for. Yeah. Yeah. Just on that point, and I want to chat about what you do and what your business does. But give us a, what is Paddle in a nutshell? Yeah, um, so Paddle is effectively miniature tennis. That's the mm. easiest way to describe it. In a, it's a 10 by 20 rectangle. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a tennis court, same net, same scoring as tennis. 15 love, 15 all, 30-15. The biggest difference is it's got a, along the side of the court is a mesh, a fencing, and at the mm -hmm. back of the court is glass. And the idea behind paddle is everything is underhand and quite softly played. It's, you place the ball 
the ball always has to bounce, be, over, goes over the net and has to mm. bounce before it hits the mesh or the glass. Okay. So it's not so much about hitting it as hard as you can. Mm. You, you, you only have 10 meters to play in or hit the ball into. So therefore, it's actually quite strategic and softly played. The difference then between tennis is that you can then play the ball off the glass wall to hit it back to your opponents, okay. similar to squash. Okay. And that's where the squash and paddle combination comes from. You can't hit the ball off the off the mesh. Mm. And the idea is once I've hit the ball over the mesh, over the net, sorry, I want to try and make it bounce and hit into the mesh because the mesh creates uncertainty. You don't know where yes, it's yes. going to go. Okay. It's going to bounce funny, and that's sort of how you end the point. Sure. But underhand serving, mm. no overhead serving, um, and very similar to tennis strokes and tennis strategy. So there's this whole massive debate going around whether the tennis players are better or the squash players. Okay. And I hate to admit it right now as a squash player, but it definitely <laughs> favors more the tennis player. Yeah. Uh, simply because it's about getting up to the net as quickly as mm. possible with your partner and trying to command the net okay. um, and dominate. And if the ball goes over you, the minute it goes over you, then that team will rush the net and try to own the net. Okay. And squash so, players tend to sort of hang back a little bit. Hang at the hundred. So you can get forward to hit the shot. It doesn't have to bounce first. No. You actually want to try to volley everything and, 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 and smash it as much as okay. you can. So then you just limit the angle. Okay. What is critical about this, and this is where it gets interesting, is that yeah. as opposed to, like, let's say doubles tennis, mm. where one one person might stay in at the back of the court and one right up mm -hmm. at the net, in paddle, you want to mimic your partner. So if you, if you whatever one's doing, mo both must be back, or you both must be okay. front. So you move as a unified force. If you open the gap, your opponents have too many areas to expose you. Okay. Um, so it's a lot of strategy with your with your teammate going, okay, when he starts running forward or she, you start running. Yeah, yeah. When they run backwards, you run backwards. Oh, um, that's brilliant. So it's good fun. Yeah. Really good and fun. Lots of laughs. Lots of yeah. missing the ball because the racket is so short. Yeah. So lots of fresh <laughs> airs that everybody laughs at. Um, <laughs> a lot of fun. Hundred percent. Well, I, I think you know the shorter racket. The underhand and the playing it softer makes it a lot safer for families to come in with younger kids, for younger kids to play. So it's not something where you're getting worried at putting yourself or your 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 kids at risk, um, you know, kind of thing. And and I'm sure in the East Rand they love that paddle racket for a little bit of discipline as well. <laughs> so it's quite interesting you say about the, the coaching. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we opened the uh, Wanderers. Um, mm. The, the head pro, the head tennis pro had been there for many, many years. And he was quite a, against paddle at, at, at the beginning because he thought it would, you know, it would take away from tennis and mm. um, it's sort of like the T20 of cricket. And, and then he came along and he played and he loved it. And mm. he actually turned around and said, you know what? Is that if he was going to get a brand new beginner who wanted to play tennis, he would actually put them on the paddle court first. Mm. And just because it's so much easier... And then once they got the feeling of a racket sport, then transition to tennis. Right. So I do think it's going to impact tennis a little bit in the in the in the beginning. I don't think so much squash because squash has its leagues and so mm. on, and that's doing pretty well. I do think it will affect tennis to start off with. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that it's it's the age of the racket sport, and if clubs, mm. especially sporting clubs, are clever, I think they can use paddle. To, to drive tennis and squash mm -hmm. again. Okay. And when your paddle courts are fully booked and you can't get a court, the overflow will go to tennis or will go to mm -hmm. squash if the club provides that environment for them right. to do that. Yeah, that's such a, a valid point. And I'm thinking of myself. I, I, I mean, listen, Nas from Old Ed's tried really hard. Yeah, Nas really there. hard. You know, <laughs> my brother got it first time. He was lobbying and running. I just, I found I was better with that basket picking up the balls, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where my skill lay. And I think because te tennis is big, it's a lot of place to move and it's very, very intimidating, particularly mm -hmm. if someone that you're playing against is upskilling a lot quicker than you. I think what's mm -hmm. great with paddle, it's four people. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen at, at the Kalani Country Club or TAC, 
they're digging up every bowling green there <laughs> and they're putting yeah. in paddle courts. And I think that that's going to bring in much younger membership and that's going to keep these clubs going because the Vols Absolutely. membership has, has most of those members have passed. You know, it, it's not it's not a young person sport as it potentially was. You know, you started in your 40s or 50s. And the clubs that, as you said, are smart are moving into paddle. Sorry, pedal. And uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so give us a, what, what do you, what do you, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yep. No, I mean, I look at a club again, like, I mean, my mm. reference is, but it's the same at all clubs, but I just know the stats around like Wanderers. Mm. Wanderers is bringing in a thousand new people into the club per month to come and play pedal. Sure. Now, for a country club that's having now access to 12,000 people to come in per annum, it's a huge opportunity for them. Yes, they're generating income, mm. obviously, from the paddle straight away, and it's a good business model for them, mm. but they now have a, they now have 12,000 people seeing the facilities of Wonders all over again, yeah. saying, geez, now we can offer membership to kids' clinics of, or, mm. or cricket or tennis or golf or whatever it might be, or squash. So... I, I, I'm a, I think this is such a good thing for clubs that we're slowly starting mm. to go down and the club subscription model doesn't really work anymore. Mm. Um, so this is a huge club, this is a huge membership retention opportunity and then obviously a membership uh, mm. increase opportunity um, for certain clubs. So it's, it's brilliant. It really is brilliant. So Paul, if we can chat about this for a moment, because you've got tremendous experience over the last 30, 40 odd years uh, with, with clubs and with membership from the golf side, from the squash side. And, and you mentioned COVID. I think the country club, you know, maybe it had, a, 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 there was a, mis- a certain co- perception around what that meant and the membership, you know, the cravat and the blazer and the, yeah. you know, the old boy in the jag. But now like mm. we're craving social connection. So we look at Johannesburg, what's that? That's restaurants, that's our malls. But Mm. the sporting club, the country club, because these clubs have the facilities, they have the bar, they have the coffee shop, they have the restaurants, they have the swimming pool, they have the other areas. It's such an, I mean, the timing couldn't be better, obviously, and it's probably the timing that's driving it, right? But this can save the clubs. Absolutely. I think, yes, everything's about timing in life, right? If maybe if this was started five years ago, maybe it wouldn't have taken mm. off. Uh, the country club, Johannesburg's of, of Joburg, the Bryanston country clubs, this is incredible mm. uh, opportunity for them and they're embracing it. Um, they've got waiting lists to get into their clubs now. And, and even those that are not members, just being able to go there in a healthy, fun environment. I grew mm. up on a bowling green. My parents played bowls. Mm. Um, mm. So for me, every Saturday and Sunday, I was at the bowling club. That's what I did. And how healthy was that for me? So I'm, I've got five-year-old twins. Mm. It is the best thing ever in the world for me going to a paddle club on a weekend. I get to play and have fun. And our kids are growing up in that environment, in yeah. a healthy sporting environment. Like-minded people. Uh, I mean, this is gold. And I think this is, this is what we crave, like you say. Mm-hmm. And it can only lead to... Um, helping clubs survive and I personally also feel that this will become a school sport particularly Mm -hmm. schools that let's say for example in Johannesburg terms let's say you've got your King Edwards that's very good at your mainstream sports Mm -hmm. cricket rugby etc then you have your smaller sport schools that maybe can't compete on that on that sport level but they will then start paddle and offer that like bit like um I've just gone uh Blank now, um, school in Bedford View that went into rowing. They purposely went in and focused on rowing. Mm. Um, in order St. Benedict's. St. Benedict's, thank you. Yeah. So um, now you can have a situation, but those schools can't particularly go and maybe build paddle courts. They can't mm. afford it. So now they will go to their local club and get their kids to play paddle or whatever mm. else at that club. That Now all of a sudden the club has youngsters coming in um, there's a business model there mm. and, and you get your schools and your clubs to actually regenerate in that particular area. And, and I think that's a, that can only be a good thing. It can't mm. be a bad thing. Um, and, and I do think we'll go back to seeing a lot more country clubs again. 
which is which is a really good thing. I mean, you talk about yeah. I grew I grew up at TAC. Whenever we came up mm. to Jan's, it was my grandparents' friends, my mom, everyone at the pool having lunch on a Sunday, you know, and it, and you met new kids, and that's mm. who we still have friendships with today. Getting chased around yeah. by John T. Aaron's, you know, the terrifying <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. shout out to John T. Area. So, well, give us a, what, what do you what do you do? What is the business? Uh, what's your involvement with Paddle? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so we try and doing things a little bit differently. In the sense, mm-hmm. there are a few Paddle companies out there already, and there are a few clubs that are just doing it by themselves as a mm-hmm. standalone club. Our model is slightly different in the sense that we, we typically find a spot, whether it be a private piece of land, council mm-hmm. land, or a club. Um, we go into that site. We invest, myself and my partner, mm-hmm. as Paddle365, we invest anywhere up to 20 or 30%. We try very hard to bring the site in as an equity player, mm-hmm. at 20 or 30%. Um, we want them to have equity because if this does take off, we want them to share in the upside. Right. They would then be paid a rental and a, a turnover clause, so they get that anyway. But we, we want them to come along, and then we typically have private investors mm-hmm. that would then take up that balance of maybe ten, five five investors of ten percent each, or three mm-hmm. three investors of fifteen percent each, for argument's sake. And what we do in different areas we go to is we will have local people invest. So, for mm-hmm. example, if we're going to Nelson. It's local people, so they will be able to drive and help their community go there and create this type of the community that we speak about. Um, and this way, and then as 365, we mm. offer the turnkey solution, literally from building the court, offering a, an imported court from Spain or a locally manufactured court, and then we run the center from uh, mm-hmm. all aspects, A to Z, 6 in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. Oh. Running. Sorry, did you lose me there? Yeah. So yeah, I lost you. Sorry, six in the morning till eight o'clock at night. Uh, eleven o'clock at night. Yeah. Oh, so, eleven. I mean, last booking. Brilliant. Last booking's at nine o'clock. Um. So effectively, a lot of the centers are closed. You finish at ten, ten thirty, um, and you lock up at eleven. So a lot of and guys. You, and you and you guys, in. you guys run that basically. Absolutely. Sure. We Phenomenal. do clinics. We do academies. We bring coaches from overseas. We bring local coaches. So. It's literally that whole experience. Uh, we manage the coffee shop. We, we run a pro shop. Sometimes mm-hmm. we outsource the coffee shop or the pro shop. But it's literally that whole experience from A to Z mm-hmm. is run by 365 um, with club managers, assistant managers, regional managers, very similar back to the Caddy Foundation propo- uh, model all the way back. But if, uh, if it years. works, you know, if it, when it works, yeah. you keep it 100%. Okay, cool. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. what would uh, what would the process be of sort of getting a new uh, a new court going, a new set of courts going? Uh, someone wants to get involved. What would the process be? I think the key thing is understanding the area. Um, first, when we first started this, it was a big race to say, well, we have to get to wanderers first or the northern Mm. suburbs and then what we've realized is that you need to do this correctly and properly Mm. and you're trying to build a club that's going to be around for the next 10 15 20 years Mm. and what's actually happened is it's hit its ceiling in places like sweden and switzerland already and a lot of their clubs are actually starting to close because they weren't built to the same standards as other Mm -hmm. clubs and now because there's an oversupply people are being funny going Paddle sport isn't dying, just the club has, has tailed off a little mm, bit because mm. people are now going, okay, I want to go play at a really nice venue. So so it's understanding that area and then saying, for argument's sake, okay, like Houghton, how many clubs or courts is sustainable in Houghton? Mm. And then, uh, and so it's IDing the area. And then we spent over two years now researching courts and what is a paddle court? And, mm. and like anything in life, there's a paddle court and there's a paddle court. And there's, right. a, there's a court for 200,000 Rand and there's a court for a million Rand. Yeah. Um, and you've got to understand that and, and build something proper. And then, um, and then yeah, like I say, we've, we've got all the processes. Once we've found that piece of land and we think that it's viable, 
we then um, start talking to the landlord or we buy the land ourselves mm. and we, we put together an investment group um, and typically then break ground and, and build a paddle club. The court. Um, uh, what, yeah. what is the life um, of a court until you have to um, you know, do maintenance or renovate, re renew it? Very good question. Um, mm. So again, depending on which court you buy, if you mm. buy a decent Spanish court, you're typically going to get a five-year warranty on the on the mesh. Sure, it'll last longer than that, but mm -hmm. but that's the warranty. So you you're probably looking at the glass and the mesh easily ten or fifteen years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then your turf, it's meant to have a five-year warranty, but what we're finding is, especially in Johannesburg, given the sun of Joburg mm -hmm. and the strength of it, we actually make allowance for to replace that turf in year three. Okay, and um, because then. Um, it's very hardy, but you're running over the same spot constantly. Yeah. And if you've, if you've got out of your 16 hour bookings per day, if you're sitting at 50, 60, 70% occupancy, mm. that's a lot of people running over the same spot. Yeah. So we actually make provision to replace that turf over two or three years. Okay. So um, I mean, you're not getting a traditional tennis court, getting that kind of traffic on it in no. that kind of area. No. So, yeah. no. Mm. And you know, um, so in the long run, to replace the turf is a hundred thousand rand for okay. a really good turf. It's it's not crazy money. Um, so to do it every three years, it's it's more than sustainable. Mm -hmm. And again, if you build the buy or you install the right court, your civils should be there forever. Yeah, if you do it properly, and um, and then your mesh and your glass. The only time the glass is going to break. And it has happened if somebody runs through it or they fall yeah. into it. Yes. You have to really, you know, you know it's not because it, it gets sandbag tested. There are certain international specs that you have to build to. But it does happen where maybe the guy trips, he falls, he knocks it with his ring first and then mm. falls through it. And that creates a, mm -hmm. but it's all shatterproof glass. So yeah. it's meant to shatter. Um, but that can happen. But it, Typically, if it if it doesn't get broken, then glass will never change. Yeah, it's like a it's glass. Just, it's just like then. someone walking into a sliding door at a golf club. Absolutely, you know, absolutely, it's exactly, exactly the same thing. You so, know? so it should be there for a long, long time, and mm. that's what's a bit interesting for us. Some of the pedal clubs that are going up, I, I mentioned that roughly a court would cost you about eight hundred thousand rand mm. in the beginning. We know guys that are bu building and putting in absolute rubbish, but it's still six hundred thousand rand. Yeah. And we're going, why would you not spend 200,000 Rand more and build a proper facility? Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of guys, unfortunately, cutting corners like that. And it's fine for year one or two, I think. But I think in year three or four, it's going to, it, the problems are going to start coming and, and surfacing. But as, as you said, with the European uh, courts, the ones that weren't done properly, weren't done to a standard of the clubs that are going to die or first. So it doesn't mm. pay to not do that. I mean, you talk about Wanderers. Our gym's in Bluebird Center. And across the mm. road from us on Call It Drive in Athol, Oakland, there's a, a large number of courts. One block up is the Wanderers. Yeah. One block behind the Wanderers is James and Ethel Gray. So, you know, if you're not putting the money in and doing it properly with everything that will keep the members coming back, you, it's not far to go to, to your competition. How, how are you finding, how do you see paddle working in underserved areas? Because I think this would be something that would be great out in Boxburg or in Springs or maybe in Richmond or Maritzburg or, you know, your smaller towns because it's a very easy sport from what we've discussed to get into, right? It's not hard. It's not complicated. Everyone that I've spoken to that started it is fully addicted. I bumped into a friend of mine, Ivor. He's playing three times a week now. <laughs> you know, and he's given yeah. up his golf. He's given up his golf yeah. for this. So, because yeah. he says, he says a game of paddle with him and his kids doesn't cost him what he loses in balls. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I, I'm a full believer in those smaller areas. Mm. Nelspray, Potchestrom, Bloemfontein. Mm. They've really got caught in Benoni at Benoni Country Club. It's doing exceptionally well. I absolutely have no doubt. The mm. only difference in the small areas, you might not have three or four clubs like around the Wanderers. You might yeah. only have one or two. But can you imagine 
going into an area like we, we're about to put up what's in Potchester. Mm. Can you imagine going into an area like Potchester where nobody's invested five, six or seven million rand into a facility there for years? And particularly, and now, no, particularly no one that's not involved with the university. You know? Absolutely. So absolutely. No private. And now you've got a very active community. They love mm. cycling. They love running. They, they, there's a there's a uh, there's a, a good um, lower to medium to middle to high mm. income group of people, um, and we're better than we've just said. Like we just said, to raise your family and go and yeah. play on a weekend. So I definitely think my dream is to make that the hub. That's the that's where we meet. Let's meet at the mm -hmm. paddle club. You know, 100%. even if it's on a Friday night, let's go for a drink. Go, let's go. You know, go for a drink. At go for dinner. Watch people play. Yeah. Go for dinner. In at in at at the waterfront in Cape Town, at one of Africa Paddles clubs, they've got an Italian restaurant where the how good it, much of, and and he's uh, an ex Joe. Well, he's Italian, but he's an ex Joe. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, um, and I've and been what, there to eat, yeah. but they say his pizzas are on the next level. Yeah. Um, and he's at a paddle club. You know, the, so, and, and you literally you sit. No, the, 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 they are insane. I, I had one a couple of weeks ago there sitting and watching mm -hmm. paddle. You know, it's like what yeah. a lack of way to spend an afternoon. Yeah. 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 So the, I think, you know, we, we talk about we look back at South Africa's history. A lot of these smaller areas had towns had golf courses like Harry Smith and they had country yes. clubs. And those are probably suffering right now. And in mem and this could definitely help because I mean, you say a hundred rand per person, but there's nothing stopping a club in a in a underserved area to go a little bit less than that, or student rates, or these kind of things. So this could really revive that country club uh, community. And as you like, the club is where you go and hang out and network and yeah. chill. Absolutely, I think we when we run the smaller communities. Mm -hmm. Like a, um, we definitely um, run it less than a hundred rand. Mm. You also have the opportunity, even at the bigger centres, like your courts. Any court in Johannesburg has off-peak and peak rates. Right. So you have student rates, you have school kids rates. So it's endless to the model they can run here. Mm -hmm. um, and whether you're paying off your centre in three years or four years, so what? Yeah, uh, a lot of people when I'm pitching to clubs saying, "Oh, but is this sustainable? And is this not a is this not going to hit a plateau or crash?" And I say to them, guys, let's look at the squash model. Mm. In perception wise, squash is dying, right? I'm going well. So in the 80s, if you bought your built your squash center, it's paid off. It was paid off after four years, five mm. years. Now you have a, a squash center that's paid off. In Cape Town, for arguments, that we still have 16 leagues of 10 teams in a league. Right. So. It's not dead. It, it might it might not be growing, but it's mm. definitely not dead. So, for example, with paddle, the same thing. Even if you, it might drop from a hundred rand a person down to mm. eighty rand a person or seventy five rand. Once it's paid off, you have a facility that's paid off, and you're still generating income for the next 15, 20 years. Yeah. But the knock on effect for a club, like you've just said, like Harry mm. Smith, for argument's sake, that is. That astronomical that mm. that opportunity just in the community in the food and beverage in mm -hmm. the, um, the the membership uptake etc. You know, just coming to the club and saying, "Hey, this is a nice place for my daughter to get married." You know, those yeah. those kind yeah. of spin-offs, absolutely. The yeah, I think if we just touch on that, do you know the history of tennis and and squash in South Africa? You know, when did they start? How did they grow? I mean, this I think is, you know, I don't, tennis was around, has been around for a long time. It boomed for multiple decades. The same with squash. Mm. So I don't see this being a challenge. And I think what people also love about it is we were stuck inside for so long. You know, we, we rolled yeah. out our training to 15 different countries online yeah. and everybody loved it. But everybody couldn't wait to get back into a physical gym. And I think for South Africans the opportunity to be outside, outdoors, in the fresh air without having to drive two hours to Michalisburg from Joburg, as an example, is something that's Very incredibly valuable. So like, mm. if we look up, I'm getting so excited about this. It's so cool. <laughs> um, to, like, how long has tennis been going in the country? How long has squash been going? 
I don't know. Like like I said, but multiple well, decades. Well, let's look at I mean, clubs. How long has the Wanderers been playing squash? How long yeah, has Kamal... Yeah, just celebrated on Sunday. They just celebrated their 135th year. Okay, That's there you go. Is. Yeah. You so the, yeah, Kalani's probably been going for 80, 90 years as well. Yeah. Uh, the TAC. Yeah, yeah. So the, these clubs yeah. have been playing tennis for 80, 90 years. Squash, 87, you know, mm. years. So I don't really think it, it's not a fad or a short term. Go. It's no. the new, it's the, an evolution in terms of how society has moved forward into an attractive okay. racket sport. Okay. And I think, you know, what makes it, I think, even stronger here than, mm. than European countries or America, we, we have such a good infra uh, mm. not infrastructure, such a structure around sports in South Africa in the sense yep. that your schools play it, so then it becomes inter-school. Mm. Then it becomes sure. IPT. Yeah. Then it becomes inter-club. Now you're suddenly starting having leagues between mm. TAC will play Wanderers in Paddle, and they will then play Rudderfoot, and... Uh, mm. So that becomes inter-club league. Then you have IPT for seniors, and then you have the mm. masters. So everything that's happened in cricket, mm -hmm. hockey, squash, tennis, the same thing will start happening with squash, uh, with paddle. And mm. um, they talk that it's going to be an Olympic sport in the next four years. That's even before squash. I mean, squash has been trying to become an Olympic sport for the last 40 years. Yeah. So the minute paddle becomes an Olympic sport, then all of a sudden your youngsters are going, wow, I can actually go to the Olympics. Yep. Uh, your, 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 your national bodies will start putting money towards that sport. Mm. And once that starts taking place, then it sort of becomes, it just starts rolling by itself. Mm. And, and our job as club owners is mm. literally just to promote and grow that and, and create those environments for club leagues, junior leagues, mm -hmm. IPTs, et cetera, et cetera. Which is what you've been doing for nearly four decades, right? Exactly. This yeah. is not uh, rocket science. This is basically taking the best of the squash world, the best mm -hmm. of the golf world, the best of the tennis world, the best of everything of sports in South Africa, mashing it all together and creating mm -hmm. a, an offering that is applicable to the South African lifestyle. True. 100%. And it, and it is all lifestyle. That's it. So in, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, where do you see the future of the sport going? Uh, we can touch on that. I mean, we've covered a lot of that. But I also wanted to talk about the community around paddle. So you going to play with your family, you're going to play with your mates. Do you see a lot of interaction between the different groups after the matches? Because I'm assuming they're all starting at one, all starting at, you know, two. At, so mm. you're coming mm -hmm. on and off the courts at the same time. What's the social aspect like? You know, could this so be the new that. single dating scene? <laughs> Yeah, we, we laugh about that. I think this is uh, absolutely this is the new Tinder in South Africa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got yeah. swipe right and uh, swipe left. <laughs> so, um, what's been phenomenal, and I can actually mm. give you some stats around this, is yeah. most pedal clubs have their own WhatsApp group, mm. and those WhatsApp groups are typically four, five, six times strong now. And what people are doing when you book a pedal court on this app called Playtomic. Mm. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to book for yourself um, add your other three friends, pay for everybody or just pay for yourself, or you can actually book the court and with you and a partner. And then what guys are doing is they're then posting that booking onto that local WhatsApp group sure. and saying, guys, we're looking for two more. And what's very interesting for me, I used to mm. think if I looked at the golf world in South Africa, guys sort of stuck to their four balls. They mm -hmm. always played the same four balls. They weren't so keen to bring other people in. Mm. In paddle, um, and I'm, I'm part of many of these groups, but statistically, we even know from Platonic that we are the number one country in the world mm. where we call, we are having open matches, if I could call it that, where people right, are yeah. saying, right, I've, I'm looking for one more, two more, three more. And people are just jumping on and going, okay, cool. My ranking is very similar to yours. Let's play. Right. Sure. And and sometimes, and from that, you now all of a sudden going, okay, mm. I'm now just met 16, 20 new people out of mm. nowhere. And now when you're trying to look for a game, you, you immediately have this little community and this little network of 16 random people you never knew before who you can now set up a game with. Sure. You're talking after the game. It's almost like the golfer in the back of the office when he used to come home and he used to sit with his wife and say, on hole number three, 
I yeah. played a left hook <laughs> and the wife is going, if I have to hear every single stroke around the whole 18 holes, and that's what's happening in the paddle, guys. They're sitting and they're now sitting in their office. They're talking about how they played this shot and that shot. Yeah, yeah. Spanish name. So the community is absolutely amazing. It sure. Really is. And that, that's something that we've so desperately needed. Yeah. So you mentioned rankings. Can we? How do the rankings work? How does the app work? Because, I mean, I'm assuming then you could use the app if you go to Cape Town on holiday and book a game down there. If, even if you don't know anyone, hey, I've got two hours to kill between meetings or whatever. I can go and get in a game. Absolutely. So that's the intention. It's not even a, it's not even a local thing. It's an international mm. app. Um, there's two or three of them around the world. In South Africa, it happens to be Playtomic. Mm. The difficulty with it is when you sign on for the first time and ask you a couple of questions to try and get an understanding on how good you are. And then you... It'll well, that'll be easy for me to out. answer. <laughs> that'll spit out like a ranking of one or two. Okay. And to put that in perspective, like a really good paddle play in South Africa is a five. Anybody that's mm -hmm. sitting in the fours is also very good. Um, but overseas, the guys are sitting in sevens and eights. You know, okay. it's quite crazy. So we are, we are very weak compared to the rest, but we've been playing for a year and a half. Mm, mm. But the most people that have got some kind of squash or tennis background would start in the ones and the twos. And then that's the great thing. Exactly what you say is you go to Cape Town, you're a 2.1, you put it on a, the local group and somebody goes, okay, I'm also a 2.1 or a 1.9. And, and that's exactly how you get to sure. hook up. Um, and then as you play more matches and depending on who you beat, if, if they take, let's say you and I are playing together and I'm a three and you're a two, that's a five. Mm -hmm. And then we're playing against a combination that's a six for arguments, three and right. three. If we beat them, we're going to get a little bit more points because we're beating people better than us. Um, sure. If you're playing people on the same, then you get less mm -hmm. points. And if you lose to somebody that you shouldn't lose to, then you're going to lose points. Points, okay. And after about 10 or so games, you start getting this algorithm there's a little bit of contention around it because mm. there's a lot of people that the ranking's not 100% accurate for and simply because they are really, really good. But mm. they also like to play with all different kinds of standards of people. So they win a lot, they lose a lot. So it's a good indicative mm. starting point, but it's not 100% correct. Okay. And then the app, very simple. Download the app, create the profile. Like I say, you, the best thing ever is you load your credit card. You pay yeah. for yourself you, or you pay for everybody. The club is guaranteed to get their money straight away or they right. get paid every two weeks. Okay. There's no cash changing hand. You can sure. rent your record online if you want. You can buy your balls online if you want, or you can pay for that at the center. So it's a really easy, simple process. Sure. Very basic. That's yeah. what, and what I'm thinking of as you talking, we were, chatting about the country club so one of the big values of belonging to a club back in the day were the reciprocity agreements so you yes. belong to uh, royal joburg or to elovo and you could go to london and you could stay in that club and, and eat there yeah. and have these type and yes there was there may have been a financial savings usually not so much but it was the communal aspect of it so here you have a community already at most places in the country that you can go and hang out on. You know, I think December is going to be amazing to see what's happening with the, the paddle Absolutely. clubs and the holiday season. So there's reciprocity and we you don't have to um, pay club membership kind of thing. Exactly. You know? we, we actually um, opening in partnership with Pet Country Club. Mm -hmm. We're building three paddle courts um, and they're open on October ready for the season. And that's exactly that intention is that the guys that are going to travel from Janusburg or Cape Town mm. and go to Plet for a month. Right. They, it's the, the same community, same people, yeah. you know, and like you say, how cool, imagine saying to your family, I'm going to go play golf for six hours today, as opposed to I'm going to go play paddle for an hour, hour and a half, mm. um, or let's all go and play. We paddle all go for to play. Yeah. Hour and a half. Well, just, just as an, if four of you went to go play golf at, at an average club, at a good club, sure. what would that cost? You know, caddies. Yeah, don't six hundred do... rand a head. Yeah. Six seven hundred rand a head. You know, so you're in for three thousand rand. Here mm. you're in for six hundred rand. Yeah. Huh? Kind of crazy. 
So yeah. do you, um, I'm not sure if you want to discuss it, but do you see a development component to this as well? Uh, developing players, pros, coaches, that type of stuff? Absolutely. I think there is that, that will come. Mm. Uh, we had a very interesting, we had a um, we had two international tournaments in South Africa already. And when they interviewed the guys um, in South Africa, the first thing we meet somebody and they're good, you say to them, oh, did you, did you play tennis or did you play squash? And they typically come from one or the other. And they asked this youngster, he was 18 years old, and they asked him and said, there's a Spanish guy, and they said to him, so were you a tennis player or a squash player? And he looked at them all crazy and said, I'm a paddle player. Because from four years old, that's what he played. Yes. That's how long, uh... how old the fraud is. So in South African terms, I think we've got a, there are a lot of good youngsters out there, mm. but they've literally been playing for a year and a half. Mm. Mm. So there's a long, long way to go. And therefore, I think the eight, nine, ten year olds now that are potentially want to play the sport, that's where I think that's where it's going to come from. You're going to start running academies and mm. clinics for those kind of people, right. bringing in international guys here um, to really teach us the game because we don't know this game in South Africa. Mm -hmm. We don't. Um, but I think I think that. Yeah, that's a, sorry for interrupting. That's a huge value yeah. for us because they've yes. done all the hard development work. Exactly. We're not coming exactly. in at the beginning of the sport, so we can upskill exactly. very quickly. Agreed. And I, I think, you know, we always say to somebody, the cool thing about mm. paddle is it's a very easy game to play, mm. but a very difficult game to master. Um, very similar to squash. You know, you, this is the downside to squash. You, you, you get on, anybody can go to a sportsman's warehouse, go buy a little black ball, they're feeling like they want to go run around a squash court. They go and they, they wear whatever tack is. They, they go and they just literally take a squash board and hit to the, get the ball. Yeah. Very easy. But to be a top squash player in the world, it is unbelievably difficult sport. Yes. And, and, and people then don't really appreciate that because they think, oh, how, how difficult is this sport? Meanwhile, they're probably the most supreme athlete that you can have. Mm, mm. Paddle, the same thing. You play. When you look at it, you go, you watch the pros play right now. You go, that's not so difficult. I can do that until you try and play that shot yourself and yeah. you then realize it's an extremely easy sport, but very, very difficult to master. Very. I, so, be, yes, yeah. we've got to bring these people in. We can't have egos and mm. think that we're actually good in this country. We are, we are 20 years behind Spain, mm. and therefore we've got to respect that and learn from them. Absolutely. We're, but Which is such a wonderful thing. You talk about Spain. I've been watching some matches, I think, in South Korea, some of the tournaments yes. insane yeah. yeah insane there's like trust the one thing you can be sure of i'm, I'm not thinking i'm on anyone's level in the end <laughs> i mean just when they yeah. you know they make it look so easy to run out the court and hit the ball back in yeah, yeah, i've like, been playing this game for a year and a half now i think i've seen people do that twice and ever. both in were by accident <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> So it's oh. extremely difficult uh, yeah, to watch sure. what some of the shots they're playing are really crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, cra With, how, how much longer do you see sort of paddle growing in the country or do you think it's just going to be a continuous thing because the, it can operate in so many different markets? What do you see sure, the yeah. future a little bit? Uh, you know, like somebody asked me, that we're already at 160 clubs. Um, Sorry, let me know. Mm. It's 160 clubs, and we're about 300 courts now already mm. um, from zero. So, but, but we haven't even come close to where we are. So, what that number looks like yeah. in South Africa, I, I don't actually know to be honest. Mm. But it would probably be a good idea to go look at how many how big squash was in the 80s, how many courts yeah. there were in the 80s clubs or tennis courts, and maybe that'll give us a little bit of an indication. Um, but I, but I suppose but, it's. Yeah, I mean, it, it, sorry to interrupt. You answered the question because it, it's at such a small fraction of what it potentially could be right now. There isn't the data to project where it's going. No. You know, maybe at 40% or at 50%, you could say, okay, we see another 10, 15 years of growth. We're here to, um, mm. I think, looking at the 80s I mean, I is going at, to be. I, at, um, I can talk to Vodacom, you know, and I remember when yeah. Vodacom first started, I'll never forget this number. Vodacom thought they would hit a million subscribers and so did MTN. Yeah. I, th I don't even know what they both at at the moment. I think they're like at 40 wow. million each or something. Yeah, crazy. yeah. Wow. You have 50 million people in the country and yet they're sitting on 80 million subscribers. Yeah. So I think Paddle, I, I don't think anybody can predict what it's going mm. to be. 
and I do think we will, I do think we will go through a massive growth. And then obviously some mm -hmm. clubs will close. There is no doubt. Uh, you, you know, there's already one or two clubs in, in, in Cape Town that did really, really well in the beginning because they were so isolated and mm -hmm. they had such a big catchment area. But now one or two better clubs opened up down the road and those, those centers are struggling. Right. So it's inevitable, but, but I think if you do it well and you do it properly, I, I, think, I think we're going to get up to well past the 1,000, 2,000 mark. Okay. I think you're going to have two, 300 clubs, 400 clubs mm. with a, no, even more. Yeah, mm. you know, if each club's adding three or four courts, yeah, you're going to get up to five, six, seven hundred clubs, I think, um, okay. around South Africa. That's that's unbelievable, and I think it it, it mm. goes back to sort of what you you spoke of. Just because you open up a club for something that's popular, doesn't guarantee success. So you need it to be efficiently run, and I suppose what you guys are doing is taking that stress and aggravation away. Um, you know, I, I had a friend of mine who was a business broker, and uh, we had the opportunity to buy Club 206 on uh, Louis Both, if you remember. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, and, you know, someone said to me in the family that knew that industry, says, you'll be eaten alive. You don't know it, don't mm -hmm. get involved. So where yeah. you have the expertise of being able to run it, and then you can learn as you go, I mean, that's a huge plus, for what you guys are doing. Absolutely, yeah. I think the same as you, you know, look at yourself in your industry. What's you're running a gym. What mm. makes your gym different to the gym down the road? It, it comes down to those little things. It comes down to the community. Yeah. It comes down to that personal service. It comes down to creating a home away from a home. Um, and, and if we do that, South Africans are, that's what they're craving. Like we're saying, mm. that's what they want. That's what everybody wants in the whole world. Yeah. Um, so if you get that right, then I don't think there's a number. Mm -hmm. uh, an end number here because why wouldn't you, what, we, we've got enough people in this country yeah. so therefore it comes down to price how much it's going to cost so mm. maybe it comes down to 50 rand a person instead of 100 mm. um, but, but it, and maybe it's only 2 or 3 courts at one particular club that's fine um, but yeah, there's, there's, if, you, if you offer that kind of community mm. I, don't think, I don't think there's an yeah. end game here no, I, I think we were so, so psychologically and emotionally hammered by COVID that this is going to be a generational thing for those forms of mm. contact. And I think what also makes mm. Paddle valuable, there's no old fart association to it. Mm. You know, I mean yeah. this respectfully that my grandparents played tennis, my dad played squash, ach, that's their stuff. Mm. You know, mm. this is now for me. Um, and, you know, the, these are the fun things. And I think also financially uh, for golf courses, this is a lot more cost effective for members to do, as you said, than a round of golf. So every course yeah. should be looking at this, you know. Yeah, I mean, Royal Canada has gone and built paddle courts. When in your lifetime did you think that a golf course as prestigious as that was going to build paddle courts right by one of their tees? And I take wow. my head off to them. Yeah. They're being very clever. Um, that's what people. That's what the members are. That's what the members want. So, yeah. um, I, I think also the other really, really key thing here mm. is, um, you, you, like we say, it's so easy for anybody to play. And what's cool mm. is everybody's a beginner right now. So I think another reason for the huge uptake is okay. people don't want to miss it and go, oh, sherbet man. And um, I didn't, I want it like me, take me. I've got a lot of friends that do mountain biking. I've never got into it because I was too far behind them. And yeah. then I was like, okay, they've been doing it for four years. There's no ways I'm going to catch them. Therefore, I feel bad. I'm not going to mm -hmm. start the sport. Whereas right now, ladies, guys, everybody, want, doesn't sure. matter how good or bad you are. Yeah. But people can play right now. Everybody's a beginner. And that's really cool. That's um, from absolutely because, phenomenal and your barrier to entry is so much smaller i mean what does a decent competitive mountain bike set you back you know yeah yeah so and yeah you can rent the stuff to start so you, yeah you use any tackies you go rent your racket for 50 bucks a ton eventually you go okay cool i'm gonna buy myself some shoes i might buy myself a two or three thousand rand racket that's gonna last mm. you for a year two years mm. that's mm. it that's your car sure. there's not a 
People are saying, oh, the rackets are expensive. Yes, a top racket is 7,000 Rand. It's a lot of money. But you don't break strings. Yeah. You don't have to replace your shoes for the year. Um, that racket that I bought will last me two years. I can buy mm. a, a, a squash racket and break it on the very first shot I hit. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so relative to other sports, mm. once you've bought your, like I said, you could buy a decent racket for two, three thousand rand. Your shoes, you're done. For three or four thousand rand, you're kitted. That's it. Yeah, uh, sure. And you play, or you can rent. So mm. they really, like I take my hat off to Africa Pedal. They're the guys that brought it. They're the guys that set the pricing. They're the guys that have uh, opened our eyes. And, and it's a good thing, you know. Mm. I have a giggle in my own squash club. We pay, we, our members pay 16 Rand for lights <laughs> and you put that 16 Rand up to 17 Rand next year. And there's a heart attack for one Rand. Yep. <laughs> but guys are paying a hundred bucks to play paddle. And I'm going, guys, go fit. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, you know, so, I, yeah, I laugh because I think if I remember at Kalani, it was 40 cents to 50 cents. In the early yeah. eight, the Oaks went nuts. Like, are you mad? Exactly. It's like, by the way, nice Bentley you drove up in. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You just went and had one beer afterwards. That cost you double the price of your lights. Your lights, yeah, absolutely, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So, if if guys are thinking, hey, I want to get involved in this, um, I want to look at maybe setting up courts in my area. You know, the beautiful thing about podcasts, we can go national, international. The guys, like, how do they get in touch with you? What what is the process? I mean, they can literally just get hold of you and say, you know, we want to look at this area. Yeah. Can you come and assist? Yeah. Very simple. We don't have a website yet. It's too brand new. Yeah. But it's Paul at um, email is Paul at Paddle three six five. So cool. Simple. Um, yeah. Just drop me a mail. Drop me a telephone. My number is oh eight two triple seven two four five six. Um, and I'm happy to engage and talk. And whether we get involved in actually being partners or not, I I, I want to play a role in in mm. creating this community and being involved in the sport. I think that's the key for me. That's my driver. It has been an oil awesome. for me. So I think maybe, listen, I mean, and I love this concept as well. And, you know, we, we've grown um, with the power lifting. We've grown, when, when we started streaming it, I think two or three years ago, we were getting about 30, 40, 70 views per session. Each session is about three hours. Now we're getting well over a thousand per session. Wow. And it's by creating wow. the awareness. So maybe what yeah. might be a nice idea to do here is do a live stream uh, similar to this format. We can probably and then have a live Q&A. Guys can just come on and drop messages and questions and you can sort of speak to that and see how we can cool. we can push the community. Cool. Brilliant. That's Love awesome. It. As long as I don't have to play. Because you know the stigmatism. Um, <laughs> that was Next that was I'm my challenge. We're getting a game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll give it a try. I don't know. For yeah. me, the challenge has always been with with tennis. That about a meter and a half before the net, and to about a meter and a half in front of me, I lose the ball. So it makes it very uh, entertaining. Yeah. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking <laughs> to it. Cool, Paul. <laughs> so, dude, from cool, your man, side, is there is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think, geez, I think we've covered absolutely everything. I think uh, all I can left to add is get out there and try it. Yeah. Uh, don't what feel is, intimidated about it. Yeah. Just go and play, you know. Yeah. Just what is the play. starting age, by the way, on that? Uh, good question. Um, I would think I would think probably 10, 11 to play nice, 10, mm. 11, 12. Like my, my own little boy hits the ball over the net, but it, I mean, it's more just like feeding him. Uh, and I know they're giving coaching lessons to six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, absolutely, right. and that's that's fine. It works, mm -hmm. and there are junior rackets for for mm -hmm. kids. Um, but I think to start playing, probably, mm -hmm. probably ten, eleven, twelve. Um, and it's interesting for me to look is like the age demographic that the majority, definitely a lot of eighteen, twenty, twenty-five-year-olds, but no doubt that the key. The biggest group playing mm -hmm. at the moment is that that 30 to 55 year old group. Sure. Okay. 40, like that, the guys that are playing, mm -hmm. and then there's lots of 60 year olds, 65, 70 year olds all playing. But yeah. I think that mm -hmm. that 35, 40, 45, 50 age group that's your that's your big number. Yeah. 
phenomenal. I think it's, and I see that with those demographics in my gym, those are the guys who are mm. loving paddle and they're loving the yes. training that we do because we've now shifted the training around a little bit of work and maintenance for them because it becomes quite a, it's, it's quite a big thing that uh, just making yeah. sure that they stay safe when, uh, when they one thing I, if I can add to this is yeah. that uh, my wife's a physio and the one thing they're seeing a lot of people are getting injured playing mm -hmm. paddle and they think it's because they're slipping or mm -hmm. a, I just off a decent pair of paddle shoes. That's more important than the racket. But mm -hmm. everybody thinks it's such an easy sport that they just arrive and they do not warm up. They do not stretch and they run straight onto the paddle court and they think, ah, oh, and then they pull a calf and they think that's the court's fault. Mm. We all at you've got to arrive early, guys. You've got to arrive warm 15 up. minutes, 20 minutes early and warm up. You have yeah. to, you have to do it. I think you should probably, as a rule of thumb, add five. So I have a minimum 10 to 15 minute warm up, but add five minutes for every decade over 30. So if you're 50, you're warming yeah. up for an extra for 30 minutes. Kind of thing, Agreed. just to be safe Agreed. and cool down. You know? And also play a better game. You don't yeah. then waste half your time just warming up while you're wasting a. You yeah. know, it's crazy. Get up, be ready to play. Yeah, you could be spending that fifty cents on electricity for the club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And guys are funny, hey? Yeah. You never late for a paddle game, and when it's if it's one o'clock and you've booked that court, you are standing at the gate waiting for those guys. To come off. To There's come no off. Thing at the time. <laughs> good. It's, funny. it's awesome. I think, you know, so maybe this is a good yardstick going forward for uh, members of existing country clubs to assess how forward thinking and how progressive their clubs are in terms of are they looking at bringing in paddle or not? You know, because yeah. you want to bring in younger members. I don't think there's going to be anything easier than bringing in paddle and anything more Agreed. cost effective for the membership. So awesome. Agreed. Dude, thank you so much. Hey. I'm going to end, I'm going to end the recording and then I'll, I'll chat to you now. It was epic, dude. Oh. Hang on a sec.